a blessed Sabbath to all of you. Thank you for joining us again this Sabbath where we are exploring uh, the subject of surviving a crisis through the mind of Christ. My name is Charles Leza, and I'm going to take you through this discussion. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the week. Thank you for your grace and your mercy upon us and that you are mindful for our mental hygiene and you want us to develop and improve and nurture the right mindset such as that which Christ had. May you speak to us this Sabbath that we may comprehend and understand the principles that you want us to learn. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today the title is part two of what we discussed last Sabbath, last medicine for mental hygiene part two. And today I am going to explore the topic trusting God over bitterness, the missing medical link. So the missing medical link when it comes to dealing with bitterness is trusting in God. And that's what I'm going to, to share with you this Sabbath. So the diet for a downcast soul is as follows. Just like the lamb when it's in need of water, Jesus Christ is present to feed the lamb with the right nutrition of food that is needed through the grass. When it's thirsty, the Lord provides the water. And so it is with us. So we're going to learn that if we give praise and thanksgiving to God, it will help us to deal with bitterness. Another way of dealing with bitterness is forgiveness and forgetting, avoiding glossing over bitterness that is cherishing, seeking a health confrontation, uproot the root of bitterness. Number six, do not cut the tops only of bitterness. Number seven, do away with suspicion, develop trust relationships, embrace the power of will. Consider your immune system that is self-care Confession sets free. And number 11, cultivate love. Number 12, choose to be cheerful. It's actually a choice to be cheerful. Of Lord to lighten up. Then finally, think positively. So we're going to look at these 14 uh, principles that we can begin to make use of so as to deal with bitterness. Number one, give praise and thanksgiving to God. Number two, forgiveness and forgetting. Number three, avoid glossing off a bitterness that is cherishing bitterness. Number four, seek a healthy confrontation. Number five, uproot the root of bitterness. Number six, do not cut the tops only. Number seven, do away with suspicion, develop trust relationships. Number eight, embrace the power of will. Number nine, consider your immune system, that is self-care. Number 10, confession sets free cultivate love. Number 11, number 12, choose to be cheerful. And cheerfulness actually is a choice. Number 13, offload to lighten up. Number 14, think positively. This is what we're going to explore today. So trust is defined as an assured reliance on the character, stability, and the strength or truth of someone or something. So it can be trust between human beings. It can be trust with God. But I'm going to explore more of trust in God. For if we learn to trust in God, then our relationships will develop trust better and much easier. And even if we develop our trust in our relatives, our friends, our workmates, it also fosters trust in God as well. Then uh, another definition for trust the first one that I read is coming from the Merriam Webster Dictionary. Then the one that I put up myself is a steadfast confidence in divine power. Science and religion are characterized by faith and belief. At the heart of relationship is trust. So to develop any relationship at the heart of it, there should be trust. Did you know that regular spiritual practices and faith in a community fosters trust, not just that, but it actually helps one to live longer, live better, and reduces the risk of stroke 
and or heart attack. Then betrayals, that is lack of trust in form of loss or failed relationships can actually cause a loss of trust. Faith can empower you to overcome stress and destructive habits. All of God's creation relies on God completely and prayer is the life current of humanity. These are gleanings, uh, nuggets that I got from uh, the writings of Ellen G. White. Regular spiritual practices and faith community meetings, these help one to live longer, live better, and reduce the risk of stroke or heart attack and betrayals, loss, failed relationships that can cause a loss of, a loss of trust. Faith can empower you to overcome stress and destructive habits. All of God's creation relies on God completely and prayer is the life current of humanity. Benefits of trust are as follows. It slows down one's metabolism, um, amplifies brainwave frequency, purifies the blood, purifies the, the blood through the air and refreshes the body, reduces blood pressure, improves general health, reduces the rate of breathing, so when one has got tachycardia or one has got a very fast heart beat or heart rate, it actually helps to reduce that. It causes um, feelings of eternal calm. Also, um, what you want to take note of, it slows down one's metabolism. In other words, it regulates uh, hypermetabolism where one end up eating more food than they need the principles. Put on trust in man. Put your trust in man or anything else and you develop challenges. You become anxious. You become disappointed by putting trust in man. So put not your trust in man or anything else, but be anxious of nothing, but in everything let God know your needs and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard you Cherish a true biblical doctrinal belief system. Remember to keep the Sabbath holy. I'm reading from the book of Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. If there is any way where we can go to trust and where we can build our trust upon, the Bible is clear, it is in the Lord, not partially, but with all thine heart. And we are not supposed to lean on our own understanding, our degrees, our experiences, they cannot save to replace the place of trusting in God. Thus, in all our ways, we need to acknowledge him, his presence, and he shall direct our paths, our ways of life. Bitterness robs the health, what does it drop off? Actually, individuals that struggle with bitterness, they have got uh, LDL, low density lipids, that is the cholesterol levels that will be high, elevated blood fats, a decrease of the beneficial um, high density lipids, all of which contribute to blood vessel diseases such as cardiovascular diseases. A sustained or chronic bitterness is associated with a significant increase in the thickness of the innermost and middle layers of the common carotid arteries, which is important in nourishing the brain. So when the brain does not receive the nourishment that it needs through the blood, one can feel foggy, just tired, not being able to put forth mental effort. This thickening is usually caused by built up of cholesterol containing material. Normally it comes from animal foods. In fact, chronic high levels of anxiety could accelerate the development of atherosclerosis in these important arteries. Those with challenges of bitterness disorders have high pro-inflammatory markers. This is important because inflammation fuels chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, arthritis. Um, so one who is going through bitterness, they rob themselves of health. Like anxiety, bitterness pales the stomach mucosa line by causing the tiny blood vessels leading to the stomach to constrict. This interferes with optimum function and can set the stage for ulcers. 
like stress, bitterness slows the emptying of the contents of the stomach, which can lead to delay of fecal matter movement that is leading to constipation. And actually constipation is known to be the mother of all diseases. Studies on rodents suggest that rats genetically predisposed to anxiety have hypersensitivity to abdominal organs, especially the colon. High levels of bitterness also reduce the efficiency of the immune system. So therefore, Ellen White has got this counsel to give us. I, I took this one out of the first, the first book of selected messages, page 346. Through belief in certain misinterpretation, interpret, sorry, through belief in certain misrepresentation of God, men's character and destiny were changed. But if men will believe in the word of God, they will be transformed in mind and character and fitted for eternal life. To believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is coming from the book of John chapter three, verse 16. This will change the heart and reproduce in man the image of God. And this is trust. If one trusts in God, they will believe in his begotten son and that he died for our sins. But Satan took away all this misrepresentation and our character has been marred, but there is hope through Christ. So when you're feeling blue lately, you might have been feeling blue and perhaps it's time to take a closer look at our physical and mental diet, or perhaps we are just playing the blues in our heads. The greatest disease in the West today is not tuberculosis or leprosy. It is being unwanted and loved and cared for. This is coming from Mother Teresa in the book, A Simple Path, New York, Ballantine Books, 1995. Friends, indeed, the observation in the world is that many people suffer from lack of trust. So there is need to foster and develop trust. And how can we do this? How can we deal with bitterness? For bitterness takes away trust. It is during these times that we need the great master artist, Christ himself, to mix the sunlight of his presence into the blueness we feel, and we'll find ourselves walking in green pastures besides the living waters. I liked this one. So looking at the world statistics, when you look at the pedometer, uh, the world pedometer, it shows that in America, 40% of all Americans, and a survey that was done by World Value, uh, in 2014, they indicated that 40% people in America have got trust issues. And then in countries like Zimbabwe, in South Africa, uh, actually in Zimbabwe, uh, where I am living at the present moment, 5% um, people, actually it looks like 5 to 10% people have trust. 90% have got trust issues. And when you look at South Africa, South Africa is around 40 to 50% of South Africans uh, do not have trust issues and 40 to 50% have got trust issues. So we can see that the world is full of people that have got challenges of trust issues. And in Sweden, trust is not only very high, but also remarkably stable. And when they look at this particular worldometer and the survey that they did, they said there is a lot of trust in that country because of uh, the way the economy has been set. That's how they put it. But I also believe that uh, it is because God is working the hearts of the many people in that particular country. Actually, uh, there's a Zimbabwean that went to work there and it is told that he was working at a company with the process gold and they would leave gold everywhere and not everywhere per se, but they would leave the gold they've processed not in a locked place or in a very secure place. And for the first month after he was done, his work would take the gold and hide it away, hide it away. And then the supervisor invited him to his office. Why are you taking the gold? We would have put it and hide it away. And then he was, I'm afraid that somebody will come and steal it. And um, then he learned that the level of trust in that country is very high. Ellen White in the book, Prophets and Kings, page 164, he says, she, she writes and says this, in the darkest days, when appearances seem most forbidding, fear not, have faith in God. He knows your need, his infinite love and compassion never weary. 
friends, when we are struggling with bitterness and appearances seem most forbidding, that is fear to meet that particular person that you have got bitterness over or even over yourself, such kind of darkness that is forbidding. Have faith in God, that is trust in God. He knows your need. His infinite love and compassion will never weary. It is your privilege to have daily a calm, close, happy walk with Jesus. Our high calling, page 97. Jesus wants to walk with us and bitterness robs us of the privilege of walking with Jesus. Friends, I'm going to present to you 14 steps that you can take to overcome bitterness. Let's look at step number one. Give praise and thanksgiving to God. I'm reading from the book of Psalms, chapter 42, verse 11. Why art thou cast down on my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Who is the health of my countenance and my God? Friends, if there is anything that we can do in the presence of this pandemic, in the presence of economic challenges, in the presence of health challenges, we can praise God and give thanks to him. That's the Sabbath. You are able to sit and listen to this particular presentation just because of that. Give praise and thanksgiving to God. Let's foster the habit of giving praise to God and giving thanks unto him. Look over your past years, even 2020, as difficult as it was with a full lockdown. The Lord, the fact that you are alive today is an indication that God sustained the breath of life within you for 365 days. That was water for you to drink. That was food for you to eat and a dwelling place. The Lord has been good. Give praise unto him and thank him for that, despite the other challenges that you might have faced. And actually the Lord took you through those particular challenges. That's why you and I today are alive. So let's foster this habit of giving praise and thanksgiving to God. When our souls are cast down, why should we be disquieted within ourselves? We need to have hope. Not hope in a friend, not hope in the husband or your wife or your spouse, or hope in our children, in our old age that they would look after us. Hope of the job that we are working at, but hope in God and give praise for it is he that is the health of our countenance. So make a choice to foster that which edifies. When you look at this particular diagram that I have here, this particular picture, when you water love, the plant of love grows beautiful. But when you choose to focus on worry, self-doubt and guilt and anxiety, that's what will grow. So let us focus on love to grow love and we'll become lovely. Our environment will become lovely. Forgiveness, forgetfulness, being patient, being having calm faith, having courage and faith and hope is all fostered by choosing love. For love edifies and covers the multitude of sins. Forgive and forget. Now, many people ask questions, how do I forgive and forget? I want to tell you friends, in the future, we're going to look at just forgiveness. But today I'm going to share with you Ellen, Ellen White's experience with James Watt. And I'm reading from 3T, page 97. The Lord is seeking to teach my husband to have a spirit of forgiveness and forgetfulness of the dark passages in his experience. The other question you may pose is, how do I deal with my negative past? How do I, how do I deal with my traumatic events I've gone through in the past? Because here we find Ellen White writing about the experiences that the husband was going through. And she writes and says, the Lord is seeking to teach my husband. Who's trying to teach here? The Lord. If there is any place where we can go to learn how to forgive and forget, it is the Lord. Many people try to say, I'm going to teach this individual a lesson because they are bitter, because they are angry. God is inviting us in the book of um, Ephesians chapter four, verse 32 downwards, that we need not foster anger and even for bitterness until sunset. We need to deal with 
forgiveness. We need to deal with anger as soon as possible. And the Lord is the one who gives us that particular strength. So here the Lord was teaching James White to have a spirit of forgiveness, not just forgiveness, but forgetfulness of the dark passages in his experience. The remembrance of the unpleasant past only saddens the present and he lives over again the unpleasant portion of his life's history. Indeed, dwelling upon our past history, the things that have been done wrong unto us takes, uh, takes away the energy and the beauty and the joy of today and of tomorrow. In so doing, he's clinging to the darkness and is pressing the thorn deeper into his spirit. This is my husband's infirmity and is displeasing to God. Ellen White, when she coins it, she says it's a disease that the husband had bitterness and it's displeasing to God for by clinging and cherishing bitterness, one is actually wounding themselves more. In the book Steps to Christ, we learn that. Instead of dwelling upon bitterness, if we handle our dark past experiences, it's like handling thorns, we'll get wounded, we'll get hurt. But if we dwell upon the beauty that surrounds us, the things that God is doing for us today, we begin to come out of our darkness of bitterness. This brings darkness and not light. He may feel apparent relief for the time in expressing his feelings, but it, is only make, it only makes more acute the sense of how great his suffering and trials have been until the whole <coughs> being becomes magnified in his imagination. And the errors of his brethren who have aided in bringing these trials upon him look so grievous that their wrongs seem to him past endurance. That which makes human beings go to a point where they are not able to endure the trials and the afflictions is imagination and keeping bitterness that we have gone through in the past today and cherishing it. Number three, avoid glossing over bitterness. Still talking about James White, Ellen White says, my husband has cherished this darkness so long by living over the unhappy past that he has but little power to control his mind when dwelling upon these Things. I want to tell you, friends, at this particular time when James White was having these particular experiences, there were beautiful things that were happening in the Church of God. New members were being baptized. The health message was booming and going forward. The wife was there loving and caring and providing for him. But you know what? Providing for his needs as far as the wife is concerned. Friends, you know what? God wants us to focus upon the beautiful things that are happening around us, the joyful things. If James White had done this, he would have quickly gotten out of bitterness. I want to challenge you today, begin to sit down and write over the beautiful things that God has done for you on a daily basis at the end of the day. If you're someone who wants to overcome bitterness or if you want to avoid bitterness in the future, have this habit of writing the beautiful things that God has done for you in your life. Circumstances and events, which once you would not have minded, magnify before him into grievous wrongs on the part of his brethren. He has become so sensitive to the wrongs under which he has suffered that it is necessary that he should be as little as possible in the vicinity of Better Creek, where many of the unpleasant circumstances occurred. You know, friends, it gets to a point where sometimes we feel like we want to leave the place where we are because of bitterness, because we cannot bear it. It's unpleasant, it's overwhelming. Friends, God wants us to have a healthy confrontation and to deal with the challenges that have led us to where we are in bitterness. God will heal his wounded spirit if you let him. But in doing this, you will have to bury the past. You should not talk of it or write of it. Friends, God here is saying, that I will heal James White. And so he will heal us today should we have bitterness. And what are we supposed to do? We are supposed to bury the past. So we need to learn how to bury the past. Burying the past does not mean just letting it obliviously and not dealing with it. And day by day by day, it eats our bodies from within. Friends, this is not what is being mentioned here. But in doing this, you have to bury the past. Burying the past is a healthy confrontation that one can do to overcome the challenges that they had in the past, which is affecting their today life. He should not talk of it. 
In other words, after having that particular confrontation, we must not continue glossing over it and cherishing and discussing with it with friends and other people, or even write of it. Or writing, taking note of it in our diaries. It is better to talk of the God's goodness. It is better to write about God's goodness. You know, I know of somebody who at one point, there were challenges that were happening in the family as far as health reform is concerned. The husband and the wife were not on the same page. And it so happened that the wife was the one that was fostering health reform and presenting it to the family and trying the best that she could to let the family understand the benefits and the principles of health reform. But the husband and the children were not part of it. But she went about talking about it over and over again to your friends, to your families, but the husband did not say anything. But she got into a point where she was bitter with herself and was going through depression for she felt now as she was walking in the streets that actually everybody else knows about what's happening in my family. But she had not talked to everybody else in the streets because in the streets probably when you're walking in there, 100 people that you're going to meet, maybe the chances of meeting a relative that you have shared this particular instance or oh, the particular challenges in your life, maybe it's maybe two out of a hundred. But then she began to get to a point where she was so depressed. She felt that everybody else she was meeting was aware of these particular challenges that were going over in her family. Why? Because she talked of it so often. She wrote about it and get to a point where she believed about it. Friends, God is saying to us today, do not talk about it. Do not write of it. When you have done a healthy confrontation with your brother and your sister or your husband, your beloved, do not gloss over it over and over again. Number four, seek a healthy confrontation. Jacob's escapism and avoidance of Esau. I'm just going to read a few passages with you so that you get into understanding what had happened here. So Jacob and Esau were brothers and they got to a point where Esau was hungry, he needed some food, and he sold his birthright to get some food from his brother. His brother was a good cook who would cook soup of lentils, and Esau sold his birthright for that. But as time went on, it was now time to get the blessings. And actually, uh, according to the culture of the East in Israel, the firstborn gets uh, the first blessings from the father. But here, because Esau had sold his birthright, that did not happen. In actual essence, uh, Jacob is the one that got the blessings of the firstborn. Esau had sold his birthright as the firstborn, but actually Jacob, the way he did it also was out of um, uh, cunningness, it was out of dishonesty with his mother. And uh, when that happened, uh, there was uh, a bitterness that developed between the two brothers. And um, I'm just going to read a few choice verses to help you get this particular story quite well. Um, and he said, this is Jacob talking to, to Esau when he'd come asking for the blessing that the brother had gotten already. And he said in verse 35 of, verse 35 of Genesis 27, and he said, thy brother came sadly and had that taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? for he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? Now, after this instance, Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his brother, his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning of my father are at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. And these words of Esau, the elder son, were taught to, to Rebekah, the mother, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise and flee thou to Laban, my brother to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. And I will send and fetch thee from thence, why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Genesis 27, verse 35 to 36, 41 to 45. So after Jacob got the blessings of the birthright that uh, the father was now blessing as he was about to depart by crook, 
had dishonesty. The brother hated, Esau hated Jacob to the point of wanting to kill Jacob. And this news got to the mother and the mother decided to help the son to deal with this situation by avoiding confrontation with Esau. Sometimes when anger is very hot and uh, the discomfort and disunderstanding is very hot for a little season, it's good to avoid uh, discussing the matter until a certain time when it's prudent, but without harboring bitterness or anger. But here we find that um, Esau harbored bitterness and so did Jacob. Instead of discussing together as brethren, that did not get to that point. He actually ran away from his parents, from his brother, as far as the mother had advised. There was no fear of death of the both brothers. So we can see here that bitterness at most and lack of forgiveness can lead to death, not just the spiritual death, but even physical death when people begin to threaten each other of committing murder. Some even become suicidal when they begin to realize no worthiness in themselves. Their self-esteem goes down. Then what happened? So when he went to stay with Laban, I'm going to read what happened there, just choice verses. And I'm reading from the book of Genesis, I'm reading chapter 31, verses 1 to 2 downwards. And it says, yeah. And he heard the words of Laban saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. And of that which was our father's hath he gotten all his glory. So when Jacob gets into the area where he's, father, his, his uncle was staying, that is Laban, he goes to a point where he worked for the wives and he was given the wives and now he had children. And it got to a point where now he was asking that he may leave the presence of his father-in-law, but his father-in-law pleaded with him to stay for he had realized that in the presence of Jacob in his life, he was receiving blessings. But Jacob asked that, can you please give that which is suiting for the work that I've done for you? And they agreed upon uh, a certain uh, percentage of the cows that were going to be born of, uh, of, 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 of the flock that uh, uh, Jacob was keeping of his uncle Laban after he had chosen the ring stacked and the, and the speckled ones. And as the years went by, it so happened that they realized that the blessing of God was upon Jacob. And Laban's sons were now saying this. This is what Jacob had. And he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. And of that which was our father's, hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban and behold, it was not toward him as before. So in actual essence, uh, his countenance, that is Laban's countenance, his love towards Jacob changed. And Jacob decided to flee at night with his family for his life. Um, but God did actually say to him, it is now time for you to go to your father's place. But the Lord did not say to him, flee at midnight, but he stole at night without saying anything to Laban. Instead of having a healthy confrontation with Laban to deal with the challenge that were arising so as to be able to live peaceably, he left at midnight. Now, verse 13, we are learning here what the Lord then said to Jacob, I am the Lord of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, where thou vaudest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred. And Jacob stole away and away to Laban the Syrian, in that he told him not that he fled. He fled. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face towards the Mount Gilead. And it was toward Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled. And he took his brethren with him, with him and pursued after him seven days journey, and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. Then I'm reading verse 25. Verse 25 here says, Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban and his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. Friends, it is God's plan 
that we may have a healthy confrontation, have a discussion about the things that we are in a disagreement or not happy about with each other and get to a point where we can resolve issues. God wants us to live peaceably for without which we cannot see God. What we need to do is to find a way of dealing with each other and resolving issues that are arising. Here we find Jacob had an issue with his brother, he ran away. Now he's got an issue with his father-in-law and his, the brothers of his wives and they have got challenges as well. So instead of having a situation where they can sit down and look into the issues that are arising, even when God had said to him, it's now time for you to return, he did not do it in the way God wants us to do. So God here allows Laban to follow Jacob and at night when he was planning to do evil unto Jacob, the Lord speaks to him and say, see to it that you do neither good nor bad. And these two brethren had a beautiful discussion and they resolved the challenges that were arising. This is God's plan. And then now I'm going to read with you uh, pertaining uh, Jacob and his brother Esau, how the Lord also laid Jacob and Esau to be able to reconcile. Uh, this is God's plan. He wants his children to reconcile in whatever challenges are arising. He does not want us to cherish bitterness. He does not want us to gloss over bitterness and unforgiveness and anger. Then Jacob was greatly afraid. Then Jacob was greatly afraid. I'm reading from the book of Genesis chapter 32, verse 7 to 8. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and flocks and herds and camels into two bands. So now as he was now, when he was done with the reconciliation with his father-in-law, now he was going back home to where his father's dwelling place was. As, and as he was going there, he was told of Esau. He's got 400 men with him and he's coming uh, against, um, against Jacob, and Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided his flock and his herds and camels into two bands, and said, if Esau come to the one company and smite him, then the other company which is left shall escape. Jacob already in his mind is thinking that his brother is going to come to smite him. So he was making strategies by himself to see how best he can save his family, and Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted up his, his eyes and saw the woman and the children and said, who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. And Jacob said, nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God and thou was pleased with me. Verse 11 of Genesis chapter 33 goes on to say, take, I pray thee, my blessing. And that is, bef that, is, that, that is brought to thee because God hath dwelt graciously with me and because I have enough. And he urged him and he took it. Genesis chapter 33, verse 4 to 11. As he's approaching his brother, God had already spoken to Esau and he's not aware of what God has done for him. For through his pleadings with God, when God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, the Lord was rewriting his history. And now the two brothers were able to reconcile. So God, when we run away from reconciliation, when we run away from a healthy confrontation, God makes situations that brings us to a place where we can confront, to a place where we can have that particular reconciliation that God wants us to have. And the two brothers left in peace. I'm reading now from the book of Genesis chapter 33, verse 15 to 17. And Esau said, let me now live with thee some of the folk that are with, with me. And he said, what needed it? Let me find grace in the sight of, of my Lord. Verse 16. So Esau returned that day on his way unto Saul. And Jacob journeyed to Sabbath and built him a house and made boots for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sakot. Friends, this is God's plan. Esau beat up with his brother to the point of wanting to kill him. 
after some years, God brings the two brothers together in reconciliation. Jacob was praying unto God to take away this bitterness away from him, to take away uh, unforgiveness and fear that was in his heart as far as what he had done. And the Lord grants him that which he asked of. It is important to have a trust in God. Should he have any forgiveness issues? Should you have any anger issues, any bitterness with your brother, with your sister, with your spouse at work, wherever, with whomsoever? Friends, it is important to reconcile. God wants us as his children to get to a point where we can trust in God and God will lead us into the pathway of how we can deal with bitterness. Number five, uproot the root of bitterness. I'm going to read from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 15. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, I'm reading verse 15. And it says here, the fifth way of dealing with bitterness. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Friends, the encouragement we are getting from the Bible is that we need to uproot the root of bitterness, and that is unforgiveness and anger. So therefore, we'll deal with these issues in the future, how to deal with anger, how to deal with forgiveness. But God wants us to forgive and do away with anger and also thus uprooting the root of bitterness. It says here, I'm reading from the book, uh, Daughters of God, the Daughters of God, page 323. Jacob was afflicted because he had made a mistake in his life. He was cast down to the very depths, alone, weary, dispirited, tortured by the recollections of his past errors and overwhelmed with apprehensions for the future. He laid him down to rest. His hipped pillow, his head pillowed upon a stone. Had Jacob's conscience been clear, his heart would have been strong in God. But he knew his present perplexities, his fears and trials were in consequence of his sins. This reflection is what embittered his life. Jacob was repentant, yet he did not feel easy under the wrong he had done. Through tribulation and through physical and mental suffering, he could only have hope to find his way again to the favor of God. Friends, when we are alone, weary and dispirited, tortured by the memories of the past errors we have done in our own lives that we are only aware of, or what other people are aware of and have been saying in public, and our cautions are not clear. And it is as if when we sleep every night, we are putting our heads on our beds, there is a pillow, there is a, a stone for a pillow, and we know our present perplexities, the fears and the trials that we have the consequence of sin and our life is embittered. We need to confess our sins for he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to know that the only hope that we have is in finding favor in God. He will forgive no matter what challenges, no matter how deep the sin we have committed in the book of Isaiah chapter one verse 18, uh, we learn that the Lord says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as red as scarlet, I will make them as white as wool. Friends, no matter what has happened in your life, no matter what bitterness has been carrying for years, Jesus is open arms saying, come unto me and I will give you rest. You who are weary, the book of Matthew chapter six teaches us that. Now I'm reading further as far as the experience of Jacob is concerned. I'm reading from five uh, Bible commentary of uh, page 1152. As Jacob struggled with the issues of his sinful past, God gave him a wonderful exchange. His nature was changed from a deceiver to a prince of God. Beautiful. This heart searching question was necessary in the case of Peter and is necessary in our case. The work of restoration can never be thorough unless the roots of evil are reached again and again. The shoots have been clipped, while the root of bitterness had been left to spring up and defile many. But the very depth of the hidden evil must be reached and moral senses must be judged and judged again in the light of divine presence. 
the daily life will testify whether or not the work is genuine. Peter also was bitter upon the, him denying Christ. And, you know, several times as he's going ministering, he had not dealt with that particular root of what he had done, that sin that he had committed of denying Christ. And here Christ, after resurrection, says to Peter, do you love me? And that was repeated three times. And Jesus eventually says, feed my lambs. You know, when we come to God sincere of our brokenness, our past history that we do not want to gloss over and we want to let go of, friends, there is hope. And this hope is that when we have gone to Christ in his presence, sincere, when we have looked upon how sinful we are, God is willing to uproot that root of bitterness, the root of sin. Confess your faults one to another. Thus we learn in the book of James chapter five, confess your faults one to another and God will forgive us and will reconcile each, will, con will reconcile us to our brethren and to our friends. And the daily life afterwards will testify whether or not the work is genuine. If it's a genuine work, we will not repeat talking about it. God will give us a forgetfulness of those experiences and help us to live a life of joy. Uproot not just the cutting tops. So there's need to uproot the roots as well. The tops of the roots of bitterness have been cut down, but the roots have been irradiated and they still bear their unholy fruit to poison the judgment, pervert the perceptions and blind the understanding of those with whom you connect in regard to the message and the messengers. When by through confession, you destroy the root of bitterness, you will see light in God's light. Without this thorough work, you will never clear your souls. You need to study the word of God with a purpose, not to confirm your own ideas, but to bring them to be trimmed, to be condemned or approved as they are or are not in harmony with the word of God. The Bible should be your constant companion. When you're struggling with sin, when you're struggling with bitterness, when you're struggling with this disease, this infirmity of bitterness, God is saying to us, confess your faults one to another. That is uprooting the root of bitterness. We need to study the word of God on a daily basis, not to confirm and affirm ourselves that we are in the right and the other person is in the wrong, that is self-righteousness, but to hear the voice of God, what God is saying unto us, and to allow the word of God to define unto us how to deal with bitterness. You should study the testimonies as well. Apart from studying the Bible, study the spirit of prophets as well, not to pick out certain sentences, to use as you see fit to strengthen your assertions of not forgiving or cherishing bitterness or anger while you disregard the plainest statements given to correct your course of action. Life sketches, page 326. Long cherished opinions must be regarded as infallible, must not be regarded as infallible. It was the unwillingness of the Jews to give up their long established tra traditions that proved their ruin. They were determined not to see any flaw in their own opinions or in the exposition of the scripture. But however long, however long men may have entertained certain views, if they are not clearly sustained by the written word, they should be discarded. Those who sincerely desire truth will not be reluctant to lay open their positions for investigation and criticism and will not be annoyed if their opinions and ideas are crossed. Search the scriptures is the admonition from God. This is coming from the Review and Herald, July 26, 1892. God is saying unto us today, if you're glossing or cherishing bitterness or anger or unforgiveness, God is saying, take the word of God, the spirit of prophecy, go through it. If there is something that you need to let go of, be willing to trust in God and let go of it. Let every root of bitterness be dug up and buried. The Daughters of God, page 120, 121. The book of Matthew chapter five verse 13 says, and he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Friends, I want to encourage you today. If you are finding it difficult to forgive somebody or to deal with bitterness or anger, 
God to Jesus before his presence. Pour out your heart to him. He will not judge you at this moment. He will not condemn you at this moment because you are willing to make it right with your brethren. He will uproot every plant, in this case of bitterness, that God had not planted. It is positively displeasing to God for my husband to recount his difficulties and his peculiar grievances of the past. If he had looked upon these things in the light, that they were not done to him, but to the Lord, whose instrument he is, then he would have received a great reward. Many a times when wrong is done unto us, we do not realize that there is a great controversy that is playing in the background. Satan and his angels are seeking to have control over every individual, but we need to be victorious on a daily basis. And in this case, James did not have this understanding. And sometimes we also find ourselves without this particular kind of understanding. And God in his wisdom, that which he would want us to do is to realize that as a servant of the Lord, you are ministering or working for the Lord, or even as a child of the Lord, he who has wronged you is wronging a child of God. So you're not going to gloss over it, but you're going to go to God with the anger, with the bitterness, with the forgiveness, and seek God to give you guidance and direction so that you are in good books with your brethren. 3T page 98, that's where I'm reading from. But he has taken the memories of his brethren as though done to himself and has felt and has, and has felt called upon to make all understand the wrong and wickedness of those complaining of him when he did not deserve their censure and abuse. I saw that my husband should not dwell upon the painful facts in our experience. Friends, do not dwell upon the painful facts that come through life. Number seven, do away with suspicion, evil surmising, and speaking evil of others in the case of Samuel. I'm reading from the book of Samuel, chapter 8, verse 4 to 10. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the king, but the thing displeased Samuel. When they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How can unto the voice of the people, in all that they say unto thee? For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt. Even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods. So do they also unto thee. Now therefore, hearken unto their voice. How bade yet process solemnly unto them, and shew them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. Many a times when people speak evil and about ourselves or pertaining our lives, many a times people gloss over that and repeat it over and over again, sometimes having a misconception, not understanding. In this case, God is trying to help Samuel realize that he should not be displeased. He should not feel rejected by the people because the people are asking for a king. Many a times people feel displeased, rejected, and honored, and loved because people are preferring someone else over them. We, what we must actually realize is this, that it is actually that the people are rejecting the love of God. And when we gloss over it and begin to talk about the evil that other people are saying or doing in our lives, we're actually rejecting also the love of God, which is what was done here. The children of Israel rejected the love of God. They rejected the kingship, the rulership of God in their life. They lacked, they lacked trust in God. And God now is comforting Samuel, helping him to realize that there is a great controversy happening here. The children of Israel are aligning themselves with Satan and his angels and thus rejecting the rulership of God, not Samuel himself. So sometimes when you are despised in life, we should realize that there is actually more to do with that than just the individual. See beyond the person and see the great controversy and pray for wisdom, pray for strength to overcome the arising challenges. For God is present, God is there to help us overcome 
all these particular challenges that arise in our lives. Number eight, embrace the power of the will. The power of the will. Neither, talking about James White, Ellen White goes on to say from the book, um, 3T page 98 still, neither should he, James Wright, write his grievances, but keep as far from them as he can. The Lord will heal the wounds of the past if he will turn his attention away from them. God is saying unto you and me today, do not keep grievances, but keep far from them as you can. The Lord will heal the wounds of the past and will turn his attention away from them. Of course, sometimes one can grieve over the passing of a beloved. Of course, the grieving process goes through denial that the person has passed away. Then it goes through acceptance that the person now is no longer there. Then it goes through, the person goes through recovery. So beyond this, one then needs to realize they should not be bitter upon God upon the death of somebody, but get to a point where they reconcile themselves with God. For there are people that are bitter with God that they lost their beloved in a way that was unwelcome. Death in any way is not welcome. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 to 18 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding internal weight of glory. While we look, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When confessions are made by his brethren, who have been wrong, he should accept the confessions and generously, nobly seek to encourage those who have been deceived by the enemy. Friends, we need to understand that when we develop bitterness or when friends wrong us, when there is anger within ourselves because of what other people have done, when we, let, when we do not forgive them, we are failing to realize that there is an act deceiver that is working in our lives and the lives of those that would have hurt us. And when they come to us to confess the wrongs they have done, we must be quick and willing to accept their confessions and generously seek to encourage those other people to have strength to overcome temptation in Christ. For we learn in the book of Matthew, um, Chapter six, when it talks about the Lord's prayer, that we are admonished to forgive our brethren, even as to for, we, we actually, when we are praying, there's this notion in the prayer that says that we are supposed to ask for forgiveness from God because we are forgiving our brethren. If we are not forgiving our brethren, how then is, it, is this going to work out? <clears throat> we need to realize that God is present, is present in as much as we need our sins forgiven. In as much as we don't want people to have bitterness over us, so should we not be bitter? Should we not cherish bitterness over other people? James one should cultivate a forgiving spirit. At the root of dealing with forgiveness, at the root of dealing with bitterness, there is forgiveness and should not dwell upon the mistakes and errors of others. For in so doing, he not only weakens his own soul, but tortures the minds of his brethren who we have had when they have done all that they can do by confession to correct their past errors. If God sees it necessary that any portion of their past cause should be presented before them, that they may understand how to shun errors in future, he will do this work. My husband should not trust himself to do it, for it awakens past sins of suffering that the Lord would have him forget. Friends, we cannot do this as individuals. Only God can help us to deal with bitterness, to forgive. Friends, I want to tell you something today. and I want to encourage you that as far as dealing with bitterness is concerned, at the root of dealing with bitterness, that is forgiveness, that is confession, these roots need to be uprooted. And it's not human, it is divine. We need to ask strength from God to help us to do this. I'm going to leave you with, a, with verses from the book of James chapter five. The book of James chapter five. James chapter five. And I'm reading verse 14. And it says here, is any sick among you? 
in this case, the sickness that I'm talking about is the infirmity or sickness of bitterness. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The anointing service of the Sunday Adventist Church is also useful to help you overcome bitterness and unforgiveness, to overcome being quick to anger. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall serve the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. God is willing to raise you up through the prayer of faith. And we're going to pray soon after this for God to give you strength to be able to overcome. And if you have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effect of heaven prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Friends, it is my encouragement for you today to take heed of the word of God. We need to be prayerful so as to overcome bitterness, to overcome anger, to overcome unforgiveness. We need to confess and repent, refrain from sin. And we need to believe that God will do this, have a trust in God and work towards the goal that we want to achieve, the goal of dealing with bitterness and begin to live a life of joy and peace. If it is your prayer today and you're saying, God, I want to overcome bitterness. I want to overcome anger. I cherish unforgiveness in my heart and Lord, I want to implement the eight principles that we have learned today. If it is your prayer, pray with me in your heart and ask God to help you to have victory over anger and forgiveness and a failure not to accept that you need to confess your faults one to another for these are the roots of bitterness that Christ may give you strength to uproot these particular roots of bitterness. I am praying, dear Jesus, may your grace and your mercy attend to your children that are watching this presentation, that are praying with me in this particular moment, that are having challenges with bitterness. At the root of bitterness, there is need to uproot confession, to uproot a lack of confession. Help us, dear Lord, to confess our faults one to another. And I pray that you may give your children strength to be able to overcome anger and forgiveness. Strengthen them, dear Jesus, for you have said in your word that we should ask whatsoever we desire and Lord, you will give. The desire for this Sabbath afternoon, Lord, is we want to deal away with bitterness and help each and every individual to be able to implement the principles that we have learned so far. Give them wisdom how best to deal with it in their given circumstance. As we continue next Sabbath to deal with the other portions the other principles of how to deal with bitterness. Help us to prepare ourselves during the week for what lies ahead of us in the other Sabbath that we are looking forward to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please feel free to ask questions. Feel free to go on our YouTube page and Facebook page and post your questions and even on our website and put your comments there and your questions they would want to feedback so that we can have peace of mind and have good mental hygiene. May the Lord bless you, amen.